Welcome to week four of The Music of the Rolling Stones, 1962 to 1974. This week we focus in on that period of 1967 and 1968, picking up from where we left off last week with a discussion of the release of Between the Buttons and that album in February of 67 and the drug bust that I promised to talk more about this week. And we'll take it uh, all the way through um, the release of their Satanic Majesty's Request at the end of 1967 and into the album uh, that follows that, Beggar's Banquet. So let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, issues uh, that are going to come up as we kind of connect up the, uh, the period after Between the Buttons leaving, uh, leading up to the period that ultimately leads into the album uh, Let It Bleed. I mentioned before these drug busts of uh, Mick and Keith, and, and then later uh, there was a drug bust involving Brian, and these significantly affect the Rolling Stones. It kind of makes 1967 into a very difficult year for the group in a lot of kinds of ways. We'll get into that um, in just a minute. One of the real um, uh, consequences of the drug busts is that it really kind of turns Keith and Mick um, into outlaws, that is, they kind of think of themselves, especially Keith Richards, thinks of himself as a kind of, uh, of an outlaw. And Brian uh, goes into kind of decline, uh, kind of an emotional, uh, mental uh, decline, uh, becomes very uh, uh, paranoid about drug busts and that he, because they felt like they were being set up. And so, you know, uh, they felt like they, they could be victims uh, at any moment of these things. Uh, and so it really does uh, have an effect on the way things happen musically in 1967 as well. Well, by early 1967 into the middle of the year, Andrew Lou Goldwyn is pretty much uh, out of the picture. Their satanic majesty will ultimately be um, will ultimately be produced by the Rolling Stones and then uh, for Beggar's Banquet Jimmy Miller will come in and we'll talk a little bit more about Jimmy Miller when we get to our discussion of Beggar's Banquet. Uh, it means that Andrew is no longer uh, managing the image of the Stones and I guess one can imagine why uh, Andrew um, might not have been such an attractive uh, person uh, to the Stones at this point. Andrew, after all, had manufactured and pushed this image of the Stones as the bad boys, and the Stones had gone along with it enthusiastically, but by the time we got to the beginning of 1967, it turned out that bad boy image was what got them into so much trouble. So I'm um, not really sure if that's, if, if that's what it was probably with a lot of people who grow up together the way these guys did in their early 20s. There were a lot of issues involved, but anyway, a split there, and um, maybe Mick Jagger taking more of a, a role in kind of managing uh, the band's affairs, especially with regard to their imaging uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, their Satanic Majesties from December of 67 uh, marks the full arrival of psychedelia and what I would call the artist approach. We talked last, last week about the Stones moving really from a sort of more craftsman kind of approach to a more kind of artist approach. And so uh, beggars, uh, their Satanic Majesties really is that record where you can really see that in full swing in addition to all of the stuff that we usually associate uh, with psychedelia. <clears throat> beggars Banquet is often seen by critics as a real return to blues rock roots. Um, and oftentimes critics will cast it as if it's a kind of rejection of psychedelia, as if the Stones themselves realized that their Satanic Majesty's Request was not a good album and they were going to get back to the roots and abandon everything that had led up to their Satanic Majesty's. Now I would like to argue that it's not really quite that way. Um, that Beggar's Banquet does mark a turning point, but it's a turning point that assimilates the many developments that that, that uh, happened up through uh, their Satanic Majesties into it. And so it's really more of an assimilation of a lot of different kinds of things in the Stones history together into a kind of a trademark sound than a rejection. And, and I'll make that argument uh, when we get to this specific discussion uh, of those uh, records. I would say that while this is a confused um, period for the band in terms of their personal lives and the things that are going on, I think it's a rich period in terms of their music. And I especially think that their Satanic Majesties is a much underrated and probably wrongly maligned album. Uh, it makes all kind of sense and is, is, is informing in all kinds of ways with regard to the development of the Stones as artists, uh, as songwriters, and in terms of their self-image. It's, it's not quite clear to me why so many people uh, ha have a problem with it unless they just don't like the music so much. But as a musicologist, it's a very valuable uh, album for us to look at, and I think uh, very underrated. 
Well, let's take a few minutes to sort of survey uh, some of the music that came out in 67, and then we'll pick up on 68 uh, in a later video. Some of the music that came out in 67, and also some of the other events, the tours and the trials. We'll get a little bit more uh, into that right now. So, as we said last week, um, let's spend the night together with the B-side Ruby Tuesday, are released in January of 67, uh, and then the album Between the Buttons is released in February of 67. Um, the group releases a compilation album uh, called Flowers in the Summer of 1967, released in the U.S. only. It does, it's, it's, it's a compilation record, but it has three previously unreleased tracks on it, although they were not recorded specifically for this Flowers compilation, their leftovers, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in, a, in a minute here when we get to talking about that album, Flowers. Um, in August uh, in the UK and September in the US, uh, the song uh, We Love You uh, is released with Dandelion as its B-side. Uh, that's the single uh, coming out of the summer. There's also a, a promotional video that goes with that that I, I want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about. Uh, it's, it's strange that in December, uh, the Stones released two singles. First, they released a single called In Another Land. Uh, we'll have a chance to talk more about this song in one of the song close-ups, a song written by Bill Wyman and almost recorded by accident. It's released uh, as, a, as a single uh, in the U.S. with the song, another song off their majesties, um, uh, their Satanic Majesty is called The Lantern as the B-side. But then, uh, almost immediately after that, uh, they released the song She's a Rainbow uh, with 2,000 Light Years from Home on the B-side, but uh, again, uh, having been released in December in the U.S. And that uh, track goes to number 25 in the, tra uh, in the U.S. charts. Also in December, as we mentioned before, their Satanic Majesty's Request um, is, uh, is released and goes to number two in the U.S., number three, uh, in the UK. We can also think about the tours and trials of 1967. As I've mentioned a couple times already this week and, and last week as well, uh, there was a big drug bust at Keith Richards' home uh, out in the countryside on February the 12th, 1967. Uh, at that, at, in the house at the time, uh, Keith Richards, Mick Jagger, Mary Ann Faithful, a friend of theirs named Robert Fraser, others uh, were in the home and uh, Keith, Mick, and Robert Fraser were all uh, charged, brought up on drug charges. Now the story that goes with this is that um, there was a, a, a periodical or a, a newspaper, a kind of a, a, a tabloidish kind of newspaper called News of the World, and they, they would have a tendency to kind of maybe make the news a little bit, like kind of get things to happen so they could then cover it. And they had, uh, they, they had advanced information that there was going to be this party at Keith's place and all of these rock celebrities were gonna be there. George Harrison had been there. Uh, Brian Jones was supposed to be there, but he was busy working on another project and couldn't get there uh, in time for the party. Um, and the, the newspaper tipped off the police that this party was going to be going on. Uh, and so the police came in and they knew they were going to find something, and they did. Uh, the charges that they ended up bringing uh, Fraser, uh, Mick, and Keith up on were really pretty small compared to what what they, they might have otherwise been. But there are famous stories about Marianne Faithful, you know, sitting on a couch wearing nothing but a rug, you know, and the sort of scandalous idea of hippie sort of sex orgy drug fest kind of deal. Well, um, uh, it, it may seem romantic in some ways now, but I can guarantee at the time it was bad news uh, for the Rolling Stones. It really was a kind of a, a culmination of the bad boy thing. And as I suggested last week, um, it was a, a, an instance of the uh, of the authorities really kind of coming after the Stones because they set uh, a bad example. Their involvement with the law, this isn't the first sort of involvement they'd had with the law. In fact, we can all go all the way back to March of 1965, and this almost seems like a comical story uh, by comparison. Uh, when Mick, uh, uh, Bill Wyman, the bassist, and Brian Jones uh, were at a gas station, the group was coming back from a gig late at night, and Bill Wyman, who usually is not the kind of guy who has to stop to, to use the bathroom, um, he just had one of those moments where it's, guys, we really got to stop. I really have to use the bathroom. So uh, they go to this gas station, and the guy who's, the, who's running the gas station won't give him the key to the restroom. 
because he doesn't like the way they look. He's not going to let these scru uh, uh, scroungy uh, rock and rollers use the bathroom and dirty up the facilities, right? So Rolling Stones get a little bit belligerent and they make faces at him and, you know, the way young men are want to do with when it comes to authority. And they go around the corner and they take care of their business against the wall there. Well, oh, scandal of scandals. In come the police, do, 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 do. And, uh, and uh, they're brought up on charges and they end up having to pay a small uh, a, a, a penalty, a small a fine for this sort of disorderly conduct. But it really, the, the, what, what ended up happening is that the, the notoriety around, the, uh, around getting busted, it just goes to show you how, what, what it took to be a bad boy <laughs> in 1965 in the UK. But nevertheless, the notoriety around it really kind of um, enhanced their in image at this point. But now we fast forward to February 67, this drug bust, uh, it's not so good for them. It's serious stuff. They're facing some real charges and some real time uh, in jail. Um, well, also in, in, in 1967, we've got Brian working on film music um, to a film that, uh, a German film, working with people like Jimmy Page and others, uh, a real kind of creative outlet for Brian. It was really fantastic that he was doing that at that time. He was so busy working out that he couldn't get to Keith's party uh, where the drug, bu drug bus was. We should all also mention that throughout the most of the time that we've been talking about, going back at least to 1965, maybe 1964, Bill Wyman has been producing other artists and finding outlets for his own songs and his own uh, productions outside of the Rolling Stones. So he's got kind of this side career uh, going on. Um, you can, if, if you want to check out some of this music, there's a, a, an album, a CD that's out there, a collection by a group called Moon's Train that uh, has a bunch of kind of rare recordings from 1965 through 68. And one record that's often brought up and talked about a bit is a, a, an album by a group called The End. The album is called Introspection. It was begun in the summer of 1967, but somehow didn't end up getting released until late 69, so it was, it was a psychedelic record. It was already late 69. Psychedelic was kind of out of fashion, so they kind of kind of missed the boat on that one. But it reminds us that Bill Wyman continued to be active outside of the Stones, uh, and it won't be long in, in our story before we see that he's bringing out his own solo album and, and has his own, uh, his, his own act uh, to, as, as a way of sort of getting his, his own musical expression out. Well, March through April of 67, the Rolling Stones do a European tour. No gigs in the UK on that one. In June of 67, there's a trial and conviction of Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, and Robert Fraser. I mean, seriously, convicted, into jail you go. Now, they didn't have to spend much time in jail. That is, Mick and Keith didn't have to spend much time in jail because they're, they were... Um, they were let out on bail and other kinds of things that to, to, to pay for their, pay their debt to society. Robert Fraser, who wasn't a rock star, he was an art dealer, was not so lucky. He actually, I think, ended up having to do most of his time. But what got the Rolling Stones out of this sentence, of this, um, of this conviction, really, uh, was an article that appeared in a big London newspaper editorial by William Rees Mogg, and it was called who breaks a butterfly on a wheel? Um, and this coming from a respected member of the uh, newspaper business uh, basically shamed the authorities into kind of letting Jagger and Richards off the hook. Okay, but again, Robert Fraser, not as lucky in that regard. But nevertheless, the whole argument was really, is this the way you deal with young people, minor infractions? You're just making it, it's, it's unfair. And so uh, Jagger and Richards got out of it. But they were very, very shaken by this experience. Mick Jagger was reduced to tears uh, in court. Um, uh, 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 Richards was stoic, but you know, uh, it, it left, it, this left a, a very, very a strong mark um, on the group. Well, by September of 1967, um, there, the official split between the Rolling Stones and Andrew Oldham occurs. Um, they, they had, as I said before, during the course of the year, been rather distant anyway, but there was an official split. Uh, at least that's the date that the Rolling Stones, uh, in their, uh, their book, According to the Stones, give as the official split for the Stones and Andrew Luke Oldham. And then in October 67, Brian is also convicted and then released, but does have to spend uh, some time um, in jail. And so you got three very nervous, perhaps bitter, in the case of Brian, a little bit paranoid, uh, Rolling Stones now. And so maybe being a bad boy uh, is not the same kind of thing uh, anymore. The interesting thing um, 
about this bad boy thing is that I've said a couple of times during the course of, uh, of our lectures here that um, what it took to be a bad boy was not really very much uh, back in those, uh, back in 65, 64, uh, 66. I mean, you know, you could be impolite. Uh, you looked a little bit scruffy, you know. Maybe you relieved yourself on the side of a building late at night. You know, that, that's all it took really to be a, a bad boy. And, um, and the image was somewhat constructed. There's no sense in which the, the Rolling Stones were any more bad boys uh, than the Beatles, uh, say. Uh, but it's the image they had. Um, and, Keith Richards uh, has famously has said, you know, the Beatles already had the white hats. You know, in the Westerns, the good guys wear the white hats and the bad guys wear the black hats. And so uh, Keith Richards had said, the Beatles already had the white hats, uh, so we wore the black hats. But before the drug bust, the hats were kind of gray. But after the drug, drug bust, they were definitely black. And so that gives you a sense that there was really a change, a kind of a, a change in attitude. And, and as you'll see, the Rolling Stones continue to try to flaunt and provoke, flaunt authority and, 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 and provoke um, a, as these next few years uh, go by. Well, let's turn in the next video now um, to the summer of 1967 to Flowers and to some of those singles.